While we walk the pilgrim pathway clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout for victory. <coughs> Sorry. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting so every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory and the toes of life we pay when we all get to heaven. Of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus sing and shout to victory. When we all went to heaven, what a day of rejoicing there will be. We all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout to victory. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout to victory. Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted above all gods. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art
this subject probably stands in the way of every relationship you'll ever have. And it doesn't matter if it's with Christ or with one another. It is the humility of being able to say I was wrong. It is a humility to say I'm not always right. It's the humility of everything. Uh, the whole life and existence of a human can be balled up in it. Am I humble? Can I be humble? Do I know when to be humble? Just like do I know when to speak out and when to shut up? I'm a vessel in the side of the Lord. I'm a vessel in the sign of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher higher, and he shall lift you up. Cast your cares at the foot of the cross. Cast your cares at the foot of the cross. And he the Lord and praise his name. Worship the Lord and praise his name. And he And he will lift you up higher and higher, and he will lift you He formed my arms before even time began. Life was in his hand. He knows my name. He knows.
knows my name. Every one of us, he knew our name before we were conceived in our mother's wombs. Before my granddaughter was consumed, he knew her name. He knew all of our names. How can you know the name of that which doesn't exist unless that which existed existed before? Tomorrow is an important vote. I'm sorry, Tuesday is an important one. The God of creation, the God of all, before there was a creation, knew your name. He knew my granddaughter's name. He knew Cece's son's name. He knows this name of my grandson. It just astounds me. And out of all the names in all the world, ever, for all of time, he knows my name. He's chosen to know my name. I'm something special to him. You're something special. You're something special. You're something special. I mean, imagine the card catalog. <laughs> Just imagine the index table. <laughs> On top of everything else that he does. And knows simultaneously. Future, past, and present. That I'm significant enough for him to know my name. To bother knowing my name. I don't bother knowing lots of people's names. But he bothers to know my name. And to remember. Just as I am. shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I come just as as I am I would be lost but mercy and grace my freedom born oh how to glory in your cross O Lamb of God I come. Let's sing verse one again. Just as I am, will I one free, but that thy blood was shed for me, and thy
coaster. <coughs> Good, I have an usher somewhere. Kind of thin this morning. We might usher ourselves. Right. <laughs> and you can go to www.paygod.com. And that got We found two ushers. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the rain this morning. Yes, Lord. Father, we are mindful, Lord, Father, how dependent we are. We ask, Lord, for your blessing and anointing rest upon this offering and tithe we give back to you, Lord. May it be anointed to accomplish all that you desire. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, here we go again, Bob. Whoops. I'm sorry, Bob. The other night we were watching TV, and I, I think it was The Circle. It may have been Heartland, I don't remember. The Heartland Channel. And there was a quartet doing a bunch of Gaither songs. I can never hear a thick Gaither song without thinking of mom and dad. I'm not a very nostalgic person, but suddenly... I want to go out to the farm and get all of their old LPs because I can almost guarantee you up to a certain point they've got every Gator album ever made. 
gotten a bunch of Chet Atkins, but I can never hear a Caper song. And they play <laughs> on the on the sh TV show. They play because he lives, and that's definitely one of those songs that just is going to forever. I think I think it surpassed what Bill Baker ever thought would happen with that song. But He Touched Me was probably one of the first Gaither songs that I remember mom and dad singing in church or us as a family singing as a special member because it was one of the first songs that I remember Bill Gaither writing and publishing. Anyway, I just I, I just felt compelled to sing it this way. Oh, well, that's because it went in the screensaver and we're done singing now anyway. Amen. Can I have some help with communion this morning? We're going to take communion together. So I see that volunteer. I've got two. We're good to go. Well, two and a half. Okay, come on up. No, I'll read this. You've been pretty busy today, haven't you, Lucy? You got that one? Well, we got to split them up in two, two ways. There you go. You help your dad. Okay, you take that lid. This is fresh for you. I'm going to read this morning from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. Familiar passage. Paul writing to the Corinthian church concerning uh, the Lord's Supper, which we call communion. Beginning at verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord... I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my blood, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'll pause there for a second, and something that I'd never really taken a second a time to consider. How many of you have been willing to give in the midst of being betrayed? I must have read that a thousand times, and it just just now that left off my page. That God so loved us, and Jesus so loved us, and in the midst of being betrayed, being betrayed, He was willing to give. Verse twenty-five goes on and says this: In the same way, also He took the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often." As you drink it, remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Many of you are aware by now, because I reiterate it, and make sure I say it every time, that what we consider Holy Communion is actually observing the Passover. And so when Jesus says, every time you drink this bread, or excuse me, drink this, this cup or eat this bread, He's referring to the Passover. You got yours too? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. So that was a prophetic rehearsal. And what he was telling them is that it's being fulfilled in your midst. In fact, he spends the next, he had spent the previous week teaching them that he would die and be sacrificed for the atonement. 
for our sins. And so that's what we start off remembering. Is that prophecy's been fulfilled. The Christ has come. He's been sacrificed. He shed his blood. He's guaranteed the redemption and the washing and renewing of our souls and our spirits and the removal of our sin. And that's worth celebrating and that's worth not taking for granted, isn't it? I don't know about you, but between the now and the last time we took communion, I had some stuff that needed to be washed, some stuff that needed to be forgiven. And so even if I'm not celebrating all the past, well, I can celebrate the recent past, amen? But I think it behooves me to, to celebrate it all. Father, we thank you that it pleased you to send your son as a sacrifice, a substitute, that you poured out your anger, your wrath upon him, so you would not have to pour it out upon us to utter destruction, even unto damnation. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you found a substitute, you found a redeemer in your son. Let's partake of the bread. We thank you for the power of the blood. We thank you for the covenant of the blood. Not a one-time event some 2,000 plus years ago, but an oncurring, perpetual event that has cleansed us, that is cleansing us, and will cleanse us. We thank you for the power of the blood. Let's take the cup. Lord, help us now to now and forevermore remember you each time we partake. Let us not take it for granted. Let us not take it haphazardly, but let it be a sacred moment to us. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Kind of continuing the series of living water. We spent three weeks already talking about living water, that Jesus is the source of that living water, and that it's the Holy Spirit that flows out and sends our life, and that there should be a well springing up in us. Well, now I want to talk about the dangers of some things that can take place in our life for us who've come. And then we take for granted what we had. So let's just talk about the topic of water this morning. Go ahead and go to the next slide, if you will. Some things you may or may not know, and these may be a little bit dated, but each person needs about 21 gallons of water a day. I didn't think I needed that much. I certainly don't drink 21 gallons a day. Okay, but that's just for a reasonable standard of living. That's in the world's poor countries, people use about two gallons a day to wash, clean, and cook. Here in the U.S., a typical person uses, look at this, 100 to 150 gallons per day. So we kind of want to argue about that a little bit. I, I did, and I saw that, but then I started thinking about it. Here's a couple of things that if you took a shower this morning and it was only one minute long, you used anywhere from two to six gallons of water, depending on your shower. I don't take, I take more than a minute shower. Anybody else? Uh, if you had your clothes washed this week, at least once, you use an average of 35 gallons, although that's, that's the average. Wash machines are getting better at that. They don't use quite that much, but if you've got an old-style one, you use 35 gallons of water, it goes in, has to rinse, has to, and if you do all the other stuff, you know what I'm talking about. How about going to the bathroom? If you only go, uh, if you, uh, you, normally we use uh, 2.5. I thought about that, even though toilets are getting better than that. I go to the bathroom more than once a day, 
And uh, I think my tank holds about two buck or two gallons of it, maybe a little more. Even if uh, you get the newer ones, it's a little less than that. Uh, but you can see how water starts to add up. And dishwashing, now, if I use a dishwasher, and they're getting better at that too, 15 gallons and all the stuff going on, they recycle a lot of that. But if I'm doing the dishes, pots, and pans, you can ask Cheryl, uh, Cheryl there's at least gallons of water on the floor because I learned to wash dishes in college with the big thing and so she goes crazy because I grab the thing out of the sink and I'm, I'm going around like crazy yeah I wear out the hose you can see like there's a lot of water that we use that's not even thinking about if you have a soda a cup of coffee all the other things that water's in if you ate green beans out of a can they came in water you, whatever you, you guys say well, you're going to go somewhere and they probably had to use water to wash the dishes before they put them in front of you they use water to make paper plates use water to do about everything so sometimes it's real easy for us to think about water and take it for granted and i think in the same way we think about what the holy spirit does for us in our lives whether we're believers or not believers and we take for granted how indispensable he is in our life, and how much, what's the volume of his activity? What's the volume of his provision in our life? Do you realize that gravity, where every one of us is using gravity today, I hope you are, but that's provided by God, that's, that's provided by the Holy Spirit that we're placed in here, and you're breathing air today, who, who supplied that, who created that, where does that come from? The water we were talking about drinking, where does that come from? The sunshine. Everything that is that's created, God created, put it in, in place, even us. And one of the things about water, you know, some scientists I've heard, maybe uh, it's dated material now, that we're up to 90% of water. You are. You're, you're nothing but a water bag. And so, so water is very important to us. And just as water is indispensable to us for our existence and who we are, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the same way. He's indispensable to us and He, and he's, and he's, he gives us life. It's who we, we are. And so we're talking about that this morning. And so a text came to me this week. Go ahead and go to the next slide, if you will. And as... To start rounding up the series, I'd like to tell you this is the last topic on water. We're going to talk about uh, clogged wells and, and all of that stuff, how the enemy will come in and earthquakes in your life will cut off the water supply and how to deal with that. And I think that's where we'll wind up with all that. There's things in life that you cut us off, we allow to cut us off from the Holy Spirit. Uh, the enemy, we allow to come in and pollute our wells and do all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that later. By the way, that's why you need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be fresh in your life all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Because one of the things, one of the most important properties of water after hydration is cleansing. And so as water, water that does not flow, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, becomes stagnant. And then the wrong kind of things live in stagnant water. The water that's moving is life-giving. Water that's stagnant and dead is, is, is poison. It'll kill you. We'll get to that here in a minute. But I want to read for you, if you want to follow along with me, for context, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 is the key text this morning. But I want to read verses, go all the way back to 7, and then I'm going to read 7 to 13, and then I'm going to jump to 19 for context this morning. But we're reading from Jeremiah this morning. Jeremiah was a prophet that God raised up in a very bad time. Israel had made a lot of poor decisions, hadn't behaved right, and so God had brought the Babylonians down on them to judge them, chastise them. And so the Israelites were now trying to find a way to negate or nullify that activity. So now they tried to make an alliance with the Egyptians. And the Egyptians, did that didn't work out. So you get the book of Lamentations after the book of Jeremiah. And what the book of Lamentations is, is when they tried to, tried to do, and this plays into what God's going to say to them here. 
their mindset and how they approached life, how they approached their relationship with God, how they had stewarded what God had blessed with them. All of this plays in here. So Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because in Jeremiah he warns them, take your whipping, okay? How many of you ever got a spanking? Well, I don't know if we get whippings anymore, but I remember I used to get whippings, right? And any, did any of you guys ever fight back when you got a whipping? Yeah, I see Lyle laughing. Okay, I, I, I knew his parents. That didn't work out very well, did it? No, when I fought back, Here's what happened. It got worse. Because now not only did my parents have to address the initial rebellion, now they have to address the follow-up rebellion. Because if they don't, now I think all i got to do is say, no, you're not going to deal with my rebellion in, a, in my uh, expanding rebellion towards them. And all I've done is created for myself a bigger problem. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, this is what Israel had done. God was using, as he often does, he uses the Babylonians, he used the Babylonians to come down and to chastise and punish them because they had abandoned him and started depending on it. So, okay, I'll show you. And so now they say, well, look, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're, we, don't wanna have, we don't want to serve God. We don't want to serve the Babylonians. We'll find somebody we want to serve. So they go down and negotiate with the Egyptians. If you know anything about world history, the, 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 where Israel and Judah were was the battleground between these two guys. They were the two great world powers. By the way, everything comes around circle, too. Where's the final war going to be? Okay? And so they're battling back and forth. So, uh, so here's what happens. Israel tries to negotiate with Egypt. Well, cut to the short of it. When you get to the end of the book, book of Lamentations, Jeremiah is drug off. By the way, they, they didn't like what Jeremiah said. They beat him up. They threw him in a well. They did all kinds of stuff, but they, God wouldn't let them kill him. Uh, they, got, they didn't like w- what he kept telling them. And so, so the powers that be were trying to shut him up because he was warning everybody, don't do this. And the powers that be was to shut him up. He's making this hard for us. Does that sound familiar? And so he ends up getting drugged drug down into Egypt with them. Okay? Now, Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations is a, 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 a case study in when you don't repent what happens. Every prophet comes to God. God airs out his grievances with his people with his children, gives them an opportunity to repent. And this is a process. It sometimes takes years because God is slow to anger. Not wanting what any to perish. And sometimes we take his patience and we believe his patience is weakness. Or we think his patience is, is apathy. He doesn't care what we do. And we misunderstand his intentions and his purposes. Like when my dad would say to me, which I still, at the age of 63, have a hard time digesting. And he used to say, he quit saying it after a while, but he used to say, almost with tears in his eyes, this, is, this hurts me as much as it hurts you. Anybody ever hear your parents say that? I made the mistake of looking up at him one time. I think I was about eight years old, and I said, Dad, well, let's don't do this, and neither one of us will be hurt. (laughs) That made another problem. (laughs) Let me tell you what, them tears dried up real quick in his eyes, and there was something else that replaced that. Boy, you ain't getting it, but you're about to. So here I am, 63 years old, remembering that. So God does these things for a purpose. And a case study is the children of Israel. You, you look at Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, you find out when we don't listen. So that, with that context, and we could be here all day talking about Lamentations and the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah himself. But let's look at that as he now in chapter 2, his part, we're jumping into a message, and I'm reading from the ESV, chapter 2, beginning at verse 7. In our key verse 
is going to be 13, and our secondary verse will be 19. So pay attention. And I brought you unto a plentiful land. This is God speaking. He said some other things to them. He's reminding them how he brought them out of Egypt. It says, and I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy the fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land, and you made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. I want you to think about our country right now. This is a national rebuke that's going on right now to Israel. By the way, they've been given Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and they abandoned it. Look what he says here. The shepherds transgress against me. What was the shepherd's job? Is to take care of the flock for the owner. So he's talking to leadership, tribal leaders. The shepherds transgress against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Now, if you know the story of Baal in the book of Numbers, he could hear from God, but he was always trying to leverage it for his own personal profit. And, and in fact, Baal's, Baal's error is so prominent that it makes it all the way into the New Testament. And in fact, that's what goes on today. There's a lot of so-called people who are supposedly in it for the kingdom, and if you took away the prophet, they wouldn't be in it anymore. If they were a Chinese pastor who spent time in prison because he preached the gospel or she preaches the gospel, or an Iranian pastor, or a Pakistani pastor, or even an Indian pastor, Christian pastor. Some places in Africa, we can name all kinds of places. If, if there was no, no benefit physically for them, would they continue in it? Well, I don't know. I do know some folks who left the ministry because it didn't provide for them in the way they wanted it to. Now, when I say left the ministry, what I don't mean that they, were, they quit being full-time pastors or anything like that. I meant they quit sharing the gospel. I mean they quit teaching the Bible. I mean they quit praying. I mean they quit worshiping. That's what I'm talking about. Paul, one of the most effective pastors in the New Testament, was what we call bivocational pastor. In fact, he, he had to work to support his own ministry. Now, God lays out a way in there that that's supposed to take place. But what we see there, by the way, Paul did that intentionally because many of the Gentiles thought he was only in it for the money because they implied their own values on him and said he was only in it for the value because they would only be in it for the money. But so here we are with this situation. And so... Uh, Things that do not profit. And so what are we talking about? The definition of what is profitable was not the same as what it is for God. So is God concerned with new carpet, buildings, air conditioning, and bigger crowds? Or is he concerned with names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And so sometimes we, we have a skewed idea of what success is and what value is and what prophet is as far as it is as God is concerned Paul talks about it he says his own righteousness profits him nothing he's got filthy rags let me read on here verse 9 therefore I will contend with them declares the Lord that says I'm 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 arguing, I'm, I'm contending with them, I'm going to confront them. And with your children's children will I contend. This is a generational thing. Verse 10, by the way, so what we're getting there with your children's children, we're talking about 
Grandpa, dad, and son. We're talking about grandma, mother, and daughter. God's contending with all three generations. I want you to think about that. That's usually what extends in a culture is those three generations. Rarely do you have a great-great in it, although uh, compression of, of kids now in, in our society, we kind of see it. People, uh, anyway, let me move on. So we look at verse 10. For cross, uh, for cross the coast of Cyprus and sea, or send to Kend- Kendar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its God even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Verse 12, be appalled, O heavens, at this be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. And that brings us to our verse. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot Hold water. Father, we ask you to open our hearts and our hearts and our minds this morning as we consider this warning. Warning to our nation and warning to us as people, warning to us as persons. May our hearts not be hardened or calloused. May Satan not steal your word from us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Cisterns spoken about here are generally not constructed where there is easy access to rivers, to springs, or fountains. By the way, I like the translation here that says fountains. So they're not, they're not built where water exists. They're built where water doesn't always exist, where it's source always there. By the way, it's, I found it amusing that cisterns rhymes with systems. And that's exactly what cisterns are. They're systems to catch water so that you can store it up and you can have it when there is no water. Now that doesn't seem necessarily bad except for one thing. It implies that you're not where water is. For us, since we're equating water as being the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit, if you have the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit in you, then you don't have to go as... Now, bear with me here. What We don't have to do what often we practice is we go get in the presence of the Holy Spirit for a little bit when things get bad and we kind of get refreshed rehydrated, then we run off and do whatever we want to do again without the Holy Spirit, get dried out, get dehydrated, get stranded again, and now we're in a dry, dusty place, and we have no source of water. And so we have, when we walk in the Spirit, we will always stay hydrated and refreshed and strengthened no matter the circumstance or situation. What you and I are, and what Jesus is talking about, as we talked about way back with the woman at the well, the well they were at was a fixed location. Jesus said, let me give you a source of water that is mobile. Because he told her, you got to keep coming back to this well. Because you're going to get thirsty again. But let me give you a source that will keep your thirst quenched. You and I, we do it all the time. We get off on our own thing. We get away from the well. We, or, the, excuse me, the fountain. We get away from the spring. And we start getting down into dry, dusty places. And why are they dry and dusty? Because that's not where the Spirit is. That's not the thing the Spirit's doing. That's not the thing the Spirit of God is in. We end up walking off into that, and then what happens is 
we end up digging for ourselves cisterns or making systems we think will help us survive. And here are two things that are implied in verse 13 for us that we have to understand about cisterns. They're broken. And if they're broken, what is being implied here about this cistern being broken? Is that it won't hold water and it has no source of its own. It can't fill itself. And even if it could fill itself, it can't keep the water that it gets. Let me read verse 19 for you. Again, so keep your finger in there. You're probably wondering why I'm getting there. Now, he has a lot of other things to say, and there's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. But I want to get to verse 19 of Jeremiah chapter 2. Look at it. Your evil will chastise you. You see that? Your evil will chastise you, and your apostasy will repu- re- reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter. For you to forsake the Lord your God, the fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. Two things are in verse 19, in case we don't get time to unpack that. Number one, your conditions reveal, should be enough proof to you. Reprove means to give proof for correction. That your condition should be enough to show you the mess you made, the place you are. That, you sh- that it should be enough emphasis for you not to do it again. I, I tell on Lucy just a little bit. Al and I were talking a little bit, and we were talking about some of this kind of thing, and, and he was talking about that they went out to eat somewhere, and she, Lucy fell off the chair and hit her head, and it hurt. But, sorry, Lucy. <laughs> but she's okay. But it didn't seem to stick with her because the way she behaved on the chair again was the same she did before. So even though we experience pain, sometimes our lust or our desire to do it our way rather than God's way is so strong that we keep doing the self-destructive stuff even when it hurts. And so verse 19 says, look, your own, your own conduct, your own way of behavior it should, is chastising you. It's telling you don't do this, don't behave that way. It's chastising you. And then your apostasy, and what apostasy means is to leave the original or the genuine and substitute it for something else. And I have been in long contention that the majority of cultural Christianity is in apostasy. We've left the original teachings and substituted it with cultural interpretations. Verse 19 then goes on and says, No one see that it is evil and bitter. The results of it are bitter. And then it goes on, For you to forsake the Lord your God. And why would you forsake the Lord your God? Because you have no fear of Him. The fear of Him is not in you. And that word fear not only translates or, or, uh, or communicates to us a fear of punishment, but also a respect and reverence for provision. We have no fear of God. We don't fear what He'll do to us. We don't fear hell. And we certainly don't appreciate Him. So those two things are covered in 19. This is a national rebuke to them. And what was it? In verse 13, they had done two things. They had committed two evils. They had forsaken him and the fountain of living water, their source. And they decide, we don't need you, God. We can create our own systems for survival. And he's looking at them and saying, you're nuts. They're broken. Your system won't work. And then he goes on in verse 19 and says, look, you've... You see it won't work. And yet, you have no room for me or purpose for me in your life. And you won't do it my way, even though I am your provider. 
Wells are dug to reach water. Cisterns are built to catch water. Which is interesting because when you read the Old Testament, go ahead and next slide if you will. When you read the Old Testament, people begin to build these cisterns. There's one with water and there's one that's empty. And, and what is it all about? It's to catch rainwater and runoff, right? When you read the Old Testament, I was telling somebody the other day, because we're talking about the droughts in California, the fires in Europe, all that stuff going on right now. And one of the main themes that you can see in the Old Testament is God always brought chastisement by withholding what? The rain. Drought was a form of punishment to get you to focus on your source. And so even if, even if you build your system, you can't, you can't make your system feel it. Systems only manage resources. Systems do not create resources. They manage what exists. And what God was beginning to tell the children of Israel and, and all of those who were there, because they, they're, here's what they did. You know what their system was? This is strange. Their system was to go to the God of Baal and sacrifice their children so they could get some crops. Some resource. Anybody see the parallel there? Their, their goal was not to worship God, not to honor Him, not to appreciate Him, but to neglect Him and move on the other way. Think about these cisterns that are broken. By the way, most of the cisterns that exist out there went dry because the bedrock cracked in them. And there was no way of fixing them. It's funny, I don't remember, remember the, the swimming pool in my neighborhood as a kid. Every year they had to go in and fix the cracked concrete. Finally, they got tired of fixing the cat cracked concrete and just took the pool out. Why? Because the pool was never going to hold the water. They were continuously having to fill it. So, in this commentary, Andrew Blackwood says that many Palestinians were dependent upon cisterns. They laboriously carved them from the rock. Cisterns' waters were at best flat and tasteless. It is uh, easily contaminated with various types of growth, fecal matter, and often had a smelly scum on the top of it. When the cistern is cracked, even stale water leaches away, and the person who turns to the cracked cistern is totally disappointed to find no water present, even bad water present. And we see that today in the forms of people seeking religious forms of spiritual idolatry, hoping that they might get what they want. And some of them look quite impressive. Right? I'll throw him under the bus this morning, Creflo Dollar. Uh, have you ever listened to anything he has to say? All about money. You sow in and you'll get all of this out. They're looking for the wrong kind of profit. I mean, we can go into this over and over again, and it looks impressive. But how many of you know that, listen to me, I, I read a bumper sticker the other day that i got to find. I don't put bumper stickers on my car, but I might put this one on. And this is what it says. Don't purchase what God is going to burn. That's a powerful statement. Don't invest what God is going to burn. Well, Jesus is something similar. He said, don't store up for yourself treasure here on earth where it gets corrupted, but treasure for yourself, store up in heaven where it won't get corrupted. So really, that boils down to where your heart is, there your treasure also will be. So what is it that's most important to you? Well, that's what you invest your time in. That's what you invest your energy in. That's what you invest your resources in and all of that. And you know what? And this may irritate you, but I'm okay with doing that this morning. Do you realize how much of human enterprise is, is invested and used to try to somehow nullify the curse of the garden? 
What do you mean the curse of the garden? Remember? Because they sinned, you will toil and childbirth. You look at contemporary culture and everything is about trying to remove the curse, the punishment. Ducking the whipping. The whipping is there to correct you so that you can live eternally. But we spend more time trying to make everything. How many know the community computers and, and, and smartphones did not make life easier or less complicated? That's what it was supposed to do. Now we're in a position where we, I, I have to give, my, my phone has to be babysitted. Because we now live in a society and a culture where everybody demands that I be available 24-7. They demand you too. Let's go back 150 years ago when you had to write a letter to me. Or get on your horse and go 20 miles to see me. Before you got to talk to me. See how self-centered we become? And the more we create, we create systems. And what we're creating systems because Satan is inspiring us. Because he wants to perpetuate the lie that surely you will not die. That God cannot punish you. There will be no ramifications. There will be no fallout for your conduct or activity. Is that not what he told Eve? So look where we are today. Two things. Adam was told, you're going to have to work and sweat. You're going to be uncomfortable. Been working on my roof, man. Found out just how old I am. Oh, man. I'm telling you. I told Jay, I said, this is the last time I'll be doing this. Why? Because it's work. It was hot. Sweating. You know what the reality is? I was uncomfortable. My legs hurt. My back hurt. I was starting to get a little dehydrated. I didn't want to be out in the sun. I didn't, be, I didn't want any of that uncomfort. You know where I wanted to be? In at the computer, putting, doing a message, in the air conditioning with a little, not only in the air conditioning, but a little fan. Blows right on me. Make sure I don't miss out on the air conditioning. So it taught me a lot. So what did I spend, spend a lot of time doing? Trying to not let Dad... Spank me. And what about Eve? Pain of childbirth. Well, look. We talk about all things. Look, I'm not, look ladies, I'm not going to have a baby. I had a little stone. I couldn't even see it. And they tell me that's a lot like childbirth. And I couldn't even see the stone. So I know when I passed that, I know it ain't, I could see my children come. So there's a whole difference. So I'm not minimizing childbirth at all. But look what we do. We, have, we do everything we can to take away the pain. How many of you know, one of the things my dad taught me is, is if it didn't cost you nothing, it'll mean nothing. Right? And so here's where we are. Let me jump to it. You know how we avoid the pain in our culture of pregnancy? We abort the child. Because we don't want the pain. We don't want the discomfort. We don't want the financial drain. We don't want whatever it is. We don't want the responsibility. We don't want to be inhibited. We don't want any of that. So what do we do in our culture? Because God said having children is going to be painful. And it's not just painful when they're born. It's painful after they're adults, too. I, I got great kids, but I'm finding out that having adult kids is harder than having little kids. Anybody who's had both understands that. I mean, I can take care of a three-year-old, man. I got some control. But a 21-year-old, 24-year-old, man, it's on them now, but I still have to ride in and with them because I love them. I learned, I learned what free will really means. What God has to put up with me sometimes. Go to the next one, because I need to move on. Okay. <clears throat> so here they are. God charges two things against the nation of Israel. I believe he charges two things against the nation of the United States. He charged two things against 
the nation of Great Britain. He could charge two things against Russia. He could charge this against every nation on the planet right now. And certainly modern Israel as well. Charge two things against us. That we've left the springs of living water. Specifically speaking to those who knew God. These are people who, I, I want to draw the analogy because Jeremiah, we didn't get to read it, but Jeremiah, God starts off by telling Jeremiah to remind him I brought him out of Egypt, out of bondage. And so this is a direct analogy, direct connection for those of us who, who have chosen to follow Christ at one time in our life. We came out of bondage and we now, we're, we, we didn't know how to live and now we're learning how to live. Are you with me this morning? And same way with the children of Israel, they had 400 years living in darkness. They knew that they hoped there was a God. There's this God they heard about in their, their ancient history. They knew about Abraham, Isaac. They knew about them and, 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 and uh, Jacob. They knew about the God of I That's why it's said that way, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I hope for you it's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only. I hope it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Rick, and David and Steve and every one of us that you can put your name in there because you know them. They did not know of him. What happened is that they, they, they got in a desperate situation in the middle of a drought and they left who they depended upon and started depending upon a system in Egypt. And the system always takes ownership. You guys hear me? And so here we have this, these two evils. And the second one then, not only they compound it, not only have they lift God, but now they've tried to replace him. Do you not miss that this morning? Not only have they lift God, left God, because knowing they don't want to be dependent upon God. Because if you're dependent upon something, there is a level of control there, isn't there? Right? Well, that's what's going on right now in Russia, Ukraine, and all over. By the way, look at the... Oh, man, don't, don't, you can do it on your own. Man, I've been spending the past week looking at the potential economic collapse of the world. And, man, it's scary because I, I look at Sri Lanka, what's happened there. That's collapsed, guys. That's, that's a mess. Pakistan's on the verge of doing the same thing. Russia's e economy is now small. what did I say, smaller than Australia's. That means they're buying and selling less things than the nation of Australia does. That's how much their economy is contracting. If you've been following China, they're having a, a their, their, <laughs> their real estate market is collapsing. Okay? I heard an interesting fact. I uh, heard an interesting fact. Do you know in 1993, China did not import any oil or natural gas? What happened between now and then? Rapid growth. So now they have to import so much that they're, they're, they're now afraid of the United States Navy closing down the strait down in Southeast Asia. It was shut their economy down in 90 days. Here's the deal. If you're into the system, then the system owns you. So who, who do you want? That's the title of this message. Do you, do, do you want a cistern that's broken? Or do you want a fountain of living water? Satan brings, that's why it's called, If you, we talk about the world order. We talk about the Antichrist. That's a system that is controlled and orchestrated by Satan, demonic host. He says, they have forsaken me and they have attempted to replace me. I guess I'm going to find a place to get off the ramp because I had a whole lot. That's page 5 of 10, so I'm halfway there. And I don't know that your sister can handle the heat much longer. By the way, sisters in themselves aren't bad. But sisters are supplemental. They can be stewardship. What kind of sister are you building? You know the system I want to build? I want to know scripture in case something happens someday. And if I'm still here and the Bible is no longer available to me, I've created a system that cannot be evaporated. It's the word of God that's been hidden in my heart. 
I create a, try to create a system of discipline in my life. One of the things, look, I don't know what's ahead for us. What I do know, and this is what I'm trying to tell you this morning, is that God will stop the rain and your cistern will go dry if it's keeping you from the fountain. Because here's what happens. When it rains no more, people go looking for what? Water. And, and we're cutting to the chase because we didn't get into it. But that's exactly what God is going to do, that's doing to the nations today. What he will do to us, what I believe he is doing through the United States, that we have built our own systems and systems and you can expect them to collapse. Because in our rebellion, in our culture, we've said we've done worse. We've gone even worse than what happened to Jeremiah's people. Jeremiah's people did not deny that there was a God. They just moved away from him. And created another system so they could operate outside of him. We live in a culture today that says there is no God. And goes one step further, says you are your own God. And when we realize we're not our own God, because a God is omnipotent, and now being in here can make somebody else do something. Even governments cannot make somebody else do something. That's why they collapse. And when the system no longer serves, then people get angry and upset. And they do what we're seeing all over the world. I'm not making a prophetic prediction. But, look, let's wait and see what replaces Rome versus Wade. Let's see what replaces it. We're going to get to decide a little bit. But one of the things that, that has shown me that we have walked away, Bob came in with a mail order that you guys probably all got as well, and there was a so-called minister of the gospel telling you to vote for the death of children, and I'm not going to candy coat it any other way, be, along with many other so-called Christians. Doctors running ads that, and, and saying that I took an oath to do no harm. And to not commit adultery, to not take the child of life, is to commit harm. I've seen that ad over and over again. I click skip as fast as I can. That's where we live today. We live in a world today, when you get away from the fountain, you start looking at mud as good. And the devil, and if you're going to drink mud, you're going to die and you're going to choke. He probably can't get you to, to eat dust. But how many of you, and I'm trying to get off this highway right now, but how many of you have ever seen them old movies where somebody is stranded out in the desert and they've gone with water so long that they start hallucinating and they see where water, where it's not, and they run to where water's not, and they're literally trying to drink sand. Because they've been cut off from water for so long, they're not even sure what it really looks like. They need it desperately, so now they're lying to themselves and trying to drink that which will kill them faster. And that's the world you and I live in today. But the second half of this sermon is the good news. There is a place of repentance where we get so thirsty that we turn. Let me read in conclusion a psalm to you really quickly. i got to find it. By the way, there's a whole lot more. God judges. The, the, we looked at the judges, the, all the stuff that was listed there. I'm, look at that. See, I'm turning pages. Somebody ought to be celebrating. Look at how quick, how much of this is going away so fast. Listen, is it too late? It's not too late if we arrive in the place of Psalms 63.1, which is a prayer. A lament to God. O God, thou art my God. That's where you start. I shall seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh yearns for thee. In a dry and weary land where there is no 
water. See, the land will provide no water, but the Lord is an eternal well. So we live in the midst of a society, a culture, and a government. That's not where our hope lies. That's not where a source of water lies. That cistern is long gone, guys. It's cracked and it's dried. Our laws were meant to protect us, were they not? And yet our laws are used now to destroy us. Our laws were meant to guarantee our freedoms, but our laws are now used to en en enslave us. And it's going to come to the final point where the system says you have to serve me and nothing else. And you'll come to a place where you'll either serve God or you'll serve the system. You're either going to go to the fountain or you're going to go to a dry, barren, empty, broken cistern and hope for a little bit of rain every once in a while. I got to tell you, when I walked out this morning after that rain came in, I don't know if rain came in. We got heavy rain. Woke me up this morning. First thing I went to do is I went walked out to see if the cracks were closed in my yard. But you know what? When I walked out, it was cooler, a little more comfortable for a moment. We need a fountain. We ask you to help us, Lord, Father, to repent of our sins personally. As only the Holy Spirit can do, He can show us where we have cut ourselves off from you. And very soon, and you're already, I believe, in the midst of it, you're going to deal with our nation maybe even more severely. Our hope is that some of our leadership has gotten sanity and has begun the process of repentance. And Lord, while the church is still here, while I'm still here, while we're still here, and we have not been raptured or taken from this place, we are the restrainer. The Holy Spirit uses us to hold evil back. Let us remember that we have responsibility and that we will be held accountable for not warning the wicked of their self-destructive ways. We will be held accountable for being apathetic. We will be held accountable for being timid. We cannot find this boldness and courage in our flesh, but only in you. Give us what we need for this hour. Then in midst of a dry and desolate place, that we can become a spring, an oasis, that others can find Christ, the living water. They can find life that is not dependent upon the cloud, but is dependent upon the spring. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you for your patience this morning. If you have a need, you can gather with me. And I'll pray a prayer of faith over you, or with you, and anticipate what God will do. We have Bible study again where we're going over 1 John. And